Oh, thank you very much, Ali, uh, both for the introduction and for inviting me here. It's really, really great to see uh, this packed audience of, uh, of young, enthusiastic people, uh, and I hope that I will uh, meet your expectations. So what I want to say is please stop me. I really enjoy being interrupted. What I don't enjoy is if we get at the end of this uh, hour and a half uh, and you feel that you have understood nothing. So if, please, if you feel that something is not clear, that I'm going too fast, uh, stop me. I have put all the didactic part at the beginning of the talk and at the end I present a few applications. So it's not important that you go through the whole of the applications, but it's important uh, that you understand what are the main concepts uh, behind uh, this technique. So please uh, interrupt me as much as you wish. So um, the, the outline of the talk is going to go like this. So we will start with an introduction to what I mean when I speak about nuclear quantum effects and what sort of the, the standard technique uh, to model them uh, in the condensed matter. Um, and then I will discuss some techniques that I've been uh, working on since my PhD to obtain uh, this kind of uh, modeling uh, with much, much reduced computational effort because you will see this is really demanding kind of calculations. And then I will present you some applications that are specifically uh, dealing with, uh, with, with water. Okay. So, uh, okay, getting started, uh, what do I mean by nuclear quantum effects? Uh, I certainly am not speaking about anything that has to do with nuclear physics. Here we are uh, happily considering nuclei to be uh, positively charged point particles. We really don't care much about the inner structure of a nucleo nucleus. All that we care about is the fact that uh, um, even though in most simulations, in particular in molecular dynamics, I know you had an introduction to molecular dynamics uh, at the beginning of last week uh, from Professor Scandolo. Uh, so all of that he was talking about to you was about uh, uh, Newtonian mechanics. So uh, solving perhaps uh, the, um, the, the Schrodinger equation for the electrons quantum mechanically, but then using the forces that had been computed uh, by solving the Schrodinger equation to evolve uh, the dynamics of the nuclei classically, as if the nuclei were classical particles. So this is a fantastically good approximation if you are uh, simulating, uh, I don't know, um, plutonium, uranium, some very, very heavy elements. But if you're dealing with something like hydrogen, this is not such a good approximation. And you, you can recognize this very, very simply just by comparing for different vibrational modes of your molecule or material, the quantum of harmonic energy and uh, KBT, the quantum of thermal energy, so as to speak. So whenever this ratio is larger than one, it means, first of all, that zero-point energy fluctuations will be at least as important as thermal fluctuations. And second, that excitations in your system of the, of the ionic degrees of freedom will be more complicated. Okay? So these two effects are a manifestation of the quantum nature of the nuclei. And if you look at a realistic system, just liquid water, uh, you can see, first of all, that you can recast this expression to see that all the modes with, um, with a frequency in excess of 200 inverse centimeters will be more and more quantized. And then if you look at the vibrational spectrum of liquid water, you can see that 95% of the ionic degrees of freedom exhibit some degree of, of quantumness, which is completely ignored if you do molecular dynamics, treating the nuclei as classical particles and using Boltzmann statistics, uh, uh, which is fully classical, okay? So you can actually, so you can ask yourself, okay, how do I see these from experiments? Do you have any way to quantify how important these effects are uh, just based on experimental observation? And a very easy way to do that is just look at the, um, at physical properties of isotopically pure mm, water. So basically, the, the point is that the more massive, uh, for a given uh, um, Born-Oppenheimer potential energy surface, the more massive uh, a nucleus become, the smaller the frequency, the least quantum. So you can look, for instance, at the heat capacity or at the pH of H2O, D2O, and when you have it also for tritium-2O. And you extrapolate on an appropriate scale, 
and you can see, well, you can see two things. The first thing is that, uh, of course, the tritium uh, is more classical than hydrogen, uh, but it's still uh, strongly quantized. And the second thing you can see is that if you extrapolate all the way to classical water, you have huge differences between the physical properties of real water and the physical properties that water would have if it behaved classically. So as I like to say, I mean, being an Italian, this is a tragedy. It would take me 30% longer to boil water for making pasta. But this is even more worrying because basically, uh, liquid water, if it were classical, would have the pH of, uh, of bleach of a dilute solution of bleach. So probably wouldn't be something very, very refreshing and healthy. And, and you can also see all sorts of quantum effects. And typically, the way to experimentally get a handle of how important the quantum nature of the nuclei is, is by looking at how the properties change upon isotope uh, substitution. Um, however, always bear in mind that uh, deuterium is not classical. So if you see a large isotope effect, the effect that you get by completely neglecting the quantum nature of the nuclei would be even larger. OK, so how do you, I hope that I convinced you that these effects are not uh, small uh, corrections, but they are really important. Now the question is, how do we include them in a simulation? How, what do we need to do on top of, uh, um, of classical MD? Now, if you plan on solving the Schrodinger equation for the nuclei, you better forget it. So people have been doing this, but you can, uh, it's very, very hard to go beyond the systems with a handful of degrees of freedom. So if you want to study something like uh, a defect in condensed phase, uh, liquid water, anything like that, this is completely hopeless because of the exponential increase of complexity of the problem. And you always have to consider that uh, the, the problem for the nuclei is on top of the problem for the electrons. So if you want to treat quantum mechanically both the electrons and nuclei, you can basically forget it. So luckily, if you are interested in, uh, in statistical properties, so in, uh, in properties that are time independent, I mean, there are many of such properties, uh, uh, I don't know, the by waller factors in, uh, in condensed phase, uh, something like pH, uh, the relative stability of two phases, uh, melting points. There is this whole set of properties for which, which you don't care about dynamics. Uh, and then you actually have a very well, not very, but at least not exponentially scaling way to include the quantum nature of the nuclei into a simulation of atoms in the condensed phase. So what you need to do is basically, rather than describing the partition function of your system quantum mechanically, use the isomorphism that maps this partition function onto a classical system, which is what we call a ring polymer. And the, basically, all that you have to do is simulate a classical system, which is described by this Hamiltonian. So if you look at how this Hamiltonian is made up, we have P copies. For each copy, we have a classical uh, Hamiltonian, uh, potential and kinetic energy. And then we have an additional term that corresponds to springs that join together the atoms in adjacent replicas. If you do this, as you increase the number of replicas, the, pro the statistical properties of this classical system will be mapped exactly on a quantum system of non interact of, of, uh, of distinguishable particles. But you know, for anything that happens at room temperature, undistinguishable, uh, undistinguishability of nuclei is really something you don't have to worry about. If you start thinking at liquid helium temperatures, then you worry about this. But if you are interested in the in the whole of the physics that goes on down to 50 Kelvin, that's, that's not a concern. Really. So the problem is that these, the number of replicas that you need uh, has to be larger than this ratio. And if you go back to water, uh, basically, you have to consider how shall I describe this system. So this is 4,000 uh, inverse centimeters. KBT corresponds to 200 inverse centimeters. So the bare minimum is something like 20 copies. And for each copy, you have to compute the potential. So your simulation has already become 20 times more expensive. Okay. So let me try to give you, um, I mean, I, I, don't, I, I really want to give you a general idea and not so much get into the details. But 
I mean, you might get the feeling that this comes a little bit out of thin air, so I want to show you how this expression for the path integral uh, uh, partition function comes about. So you can derive this from Feynman path uh, integrals and showing the equivalence between uh, the propagator in real time and the propagator in, uh, in thermal uh, imaginary time, but it's actually much, much easier to see where it comes from in this way. So you start from the quantum mechanical partition function, okay, in the position representation. So I'm just taking the, uh, the Boltzmann operator and averaging uh, it over all the possible positions. And then you could be foolish enough to try to do this. So you write the exponential of the Hamiltonian as the product of e to the minus beta v times e to the minus beta, the kinetic energy operator. Now, Q is an eigenstate of the potential. So this is just a number when it works on the, on the, on the bra. And then you are just left with the diagonal element of the of the uh, kinetic energy operator, which you can compute easily going in the momentum representation, and you get the classical partition function. So clearly something is wrong here because the quantum mechanical partition function is not the classical partition function. And uh, can you can you tell me wh wh where was the mistake? They don't commute exactly, so you can't do that. So this, I, I find that this is nice because you basically see that the, from uh, the point of view of statistical mechanics, uh, or the 100 percent of the difference between quantum statistics and classical statistics uh, comes from the fact that position and kinetic energy don't commute. If they commuted, uh, you would get classical statistics. So what you can do, however, is uh, notice the fact that if you take a high enough temperature, then you go towards a classical limit, and actually this becomes not such a bad approximation. More formally, you can basically do this kind of trick. So you take the Boltzmann operator, you formally write it in this way, and this is exact. So you basically consider the Boltzmann operator at, a, at the inverse temperature beta divided by p to the power p. This is still just an equality. And now these is a Boltzmann operator at a much higher temperature, a temperature which is p times higher. So it's not such a bad idea to do a expansion like this, which is just basically slightly better than, uh, uh, I mean, this kind of symmetric trotter expansion is, is a bit better than this, but it's the same principle. You have a leading order term that goes down as one over p square, so it converges. And now the only thing that you need to do is take this expression and plug it back into the trace. Now, when you, you, when you plug it into the trace, uh, what you can do, you know, then you have these uh, to the power p bracketed in between q1 and q1. And you can introduce uh, p minus 1 closure relations. Uh, you see, so you probably I can write this. Uh, so you start having this e to the minus beta p uh, v half uh, e to the minus beta p t uh, e to the minus beta p v half uh, and this is to the power p okay and this is computed between q1 and q1 so this is what you need to compute but then you can basically just say okay I this is really a product of uh, of several of these terms, right, p times. And in between each of these, you can insert an integral over qn, basically. So you get an expression that looks like this. Here you had the integral over q1. And so on, OK? So now you see that your problem now has become to compute this kind of matrix element. And this is actually very simple, because uh, uh, Q1 and Q2 are both uh, 
uh, against states of the potential energy again. So all of the potential operators become just numbers. And then you are left to computing these off-diagonal terms of the kinetic energy Boltzmann uh, operator. And you just go in the momentum representation and you end up with something which is uh, uh, a harmonic term in the difference between QI and QJ. And this would be basically Q1 minus Q2, Q2 minus Q3, Q3 minus Q4. And when you plug everything together, this is just something that corresponds to a classical average over this Hamiltonian. Easy. So the problem is that this is pretty darn expensive. And if you want to do this on top uh, of a initial uh, electronic structure method for getting the potential and the forces, uh, this becomes very quickly uh, prohibitively expensive. So uh, in order to show you how you can actually do this much more uh, easily, uh, or cheaply at least, uh, I need to introduce you something else. So I need you to step back a little while, and let's go back to classical mechanics. So um, you have seen uh, on, on la la last week uh, um, how molecular dynamics is basically just integrating uh, uh, Newton's equations. However, if you want to do statistical mechanics based uh, on classical MD, you get a problem because uh, if you integrate these equations, you would get conserved energy. So the total energy of your system will not change. But if you are, I mean, in pretty much any experiment you can think of simulating, uh, you will not get uh, an, your experimental colleague telling you, oh, yeah, I've run this experiment at 10 uh, milli electron volt of total energy. That would tell you I was running at uh, 200 Kelvin. So Experimental conditions are typically constant temperature conditions, particularly at the size scale that you can afford to simulate. So you need to modify these in order to allow for fluctuations of the total energy that are consistent with Boltzmann statistics. Okay, so you probably have seen something of this uh, uh, with Sandro last week. So one possibility of doing this is actually to use a Langevin equation. So Langevin equation is, is actually something that dates back to the beginning of the 20th century. And originally was introduced to model Brownian motion. So it's, it's a modification of Hamilton's equation in which you introduce a friction term, which is just minus gamma friction P. And this models the viscous drag, which is exerted by a fluid on a, something like a pollen particle that moves around in a drop of water. And then you have a noisy force term that instead models the stochastic interactions with the particles of the fluid. Now, not only this is a fantastic model for Brownian motion, but this is also very useful because uh, these kind of uh, interactions with this uh, virtual bath is actually making your system change its total energy. And the balance between the friction term and the noisy force term lead to, um, to a distribution of the fluctuations in the total energy, which is fully consistent with Boltzmann statistics. Now, you will see over and over again that for each of these Langevin equations, I will always have something like this next to it. So there is always a relation between the, the friction term and the noisy force term. So this is what is called a Markovian equation in that uh, this basically means that there is no history dependence. So the time derivative of the momentum only depends on the instantaneous value of the momentum. Since there is no memory uh, from the point of view of the friction, a fluctuation dissipation theorem prescribes that there should be also no memory from the point of view of the noise. So now the noise is not correlated in time. Um, a problem with this framework uh, is that you, if you want to use it to model Brownian motion, fine. But if you want to use it uh, to uh, simulate your system at constant temperature, and you want to do this efficiently, or you want to do this uh, together with Carparinello molecular dynamics, uh, or you want to do this together with some fancy technique, uh, you don't have much leeway to play around with. The only thing you can play with uh, is the value of the friction. So since this potentially is a way to 
modify your, your simulation so that you can get your answer more quickly, for instance. Uh, this was back during my PhD. I started playing around with the idea of actually using a uh, generalized version of this equation. And actually, if you stare at this equation, you have uh, um, a number of very nice features. The most nice feature, the nicest feature of these equations is that they are linear. Linearity is always, you know, the what you strive for because it makes everything easier to deal with. Uh, um, numerically and also analytically. So we don't really want to give up the fact that the relation between the momentum derivative and the, and the momentum is linear. But what I'm prepared to give up is the fact that there is no history. So we can generalize this by introducing a memory kernel. So you see, now it's the same structure, but now the time derivative of p depends on the past history of the momentum. So you see here I'm integrating back in time from time t, which is the time where I am now, back to minus infinity, the history of the momentum. And as I was, as, as I was anticipating, because of the need of having a fluctuation dissipation theorem in order to have Boltzmann statistics, the noisy force now is correlated in time. So this is so-called the color of noise because while, whereas the memory, if you do the Fourier transform of a delta function, it's a flat, it's a, flat, uh, it's a constant. So the power spectrum of the noise here is, is, is flat. Here you can play with the uh, spectral distribution of your noise, and this is extremely useful. I don't know if any of you is familiar with Carparinello molecular dynamics, but in Carparinello molecular dynamics, the idea is that you let the electrons move on a completely different time scale than the nuclei. And if you try to do this uh, with the Langevin dynamics, uh, it breaks down because this uh, noisy force that contains all the possible frequencies acts on the nuclei. And therefore, the nuclei start moving at uh, unphysically high frequency and disrupt uh, the adiabatic decoupling, which is at the basis of Carparinello molecular dynamics. But if you have the freedom of playing around with the spectral distribution of the noise, you can introduce uh, a high frequency cutoff uh, so that you can use your Langevin dynamics without disrupting a diabatic decoupling. And this is just one of the many uh, applications of this technique. But what really makes this powerful uh, is the fact that I don't really do this. I mean, implementing, uh, can you think about implementing this on a computer? You would need to generate noise with a prescribed correlation which is doable but messy. And then you would have to store all the past history. And at any instant of time, when you want to compute the friction term, you need to integrate back in time up to a possibly infinitely long uh, history. So this is really not what, something that you want to do. So what you can do instead is map that dynamics onto something that looks like this. So what, I've done, what have I done here? So here you probably still recognize your good old Hamiltonian dynamics friends. And now there are these S. And these are just fictitious degrees of freedom. They are not physical, but they sort of model uh, the degrees of freedom of a virtual bath. So now my bath is described by these degrees of freedom that has nothing to do with the physics of my system, which is described by these. But they, as I will show you in a second, they somehow carry the memory for your dynamics. And so formally, this is a Markovian differential equation. There is no explicit dependence on the past. At each instant in time, in order to get the time derivatives, I only need to know the state of the system at that time. So this is much more handy. And also, all of these, the only nonlinearity in all of these uh, is at the level of the force. Everything else is linear. So basically, you can see that if you take a harmonic oscillator, also the force will be linear. You know, this would become just minus omega squared q. And this is cool because then you can solve everything analytically, and you can uh, ask yourself questions about how your system will behave subject to these uh, uh, new Markovian dynamics without the need to run a trial simulation. You just uh, analytically predict how quickly your system will uh, sample phase space, how much 
uh, the dynamics of your system will be perturbed and so on and so forth. So just to give you perhaps a little bit a clearer idea of how it is possible that you can represent uh, a history dependent dynamics uh, just by extending the size of the phase space. I want to give you this example. Now think that you have uh, um, a system which is, and, and you can think of it just in, in the QP space, okay? And you have two trajectories, and these two trajectories meet at a point. So if your system were non-history dependent, this would be impossible because when you're here, if there is no history dependence, your system has only one possibility where to go, right? If the dynamics doesn't depend on the past, once you're here, you can't go in two different directions. But now if you think that these two trajectories are actually the projection on the QP space of a dynamics of a high, in a higher, higher dimension space, now, these two trajectories can actually correspond to different values of these additional degrees of freedom. So these, uh, the full lines are actually Markovian. So when I'm here, I go here. And if I have a different value of the S, I go in a different direction. But when I look at the dynamics from the point of view of the QP subspace, it looks like the dynamics was no Markovian. And you can actually show these uh, formally and it's very simple. I mean, there is this beautiful book by Zwanzig that uh, shows this very, very, very clearly. So you, you, st you, you do it the other way around. So you start from this expression, and then you say, okay, but then I can, assuming that the memory is finite, I can compute these, uh, the, 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 the time history of these S's by integrating uh, from minus infinity to time t. And since this is, uh, formally linear, you know, the, the, it's a very simple uh, differential equation to solve. The only thing which is a little bit tricky is the noise, but uh, look up Svansic, it's, uh, it's not too complicated. And then once you have solved for S, you can plug that into the expression for P, and you end up with an expression for the dynamics of P only that contains a memory kernel and a history dependent noise. So now you, you might be wondering, okay, what has this to do with quantum effects? And I'm getting there. Now, all along, I have been uh, uh, maintaining that in order to get uh, Boltzmann sampling, you must have a fluctuation dissipation relation between uh, the memory kernel of the friction and the co autocorrelation function of the noise. However, within the formalism, by which you write an equation like this, there is nothing that forces you to enforce uh, that relation. So what happens if you break fluctuation dissipation theorem? So you can regard the system in which you have broken fluctuation dissipation theorem as a system in which you have two different uh, heat baths coupled to your system. And then you could uh, design, for instance, the hot bath to couple preferentially to the fast degrees of freedom and the cold bath to couple preferentially to the slow degrees of freedom. When you let this uh, combined system run, what you will obtain is a stationary state in which fast modes will be hot and slow modes will be cold. So you don't get something which is a proper Boltzmann distribution where all of your system is equilibrated at the same temperature, but you have a stationary state in which different vibrational modes equilibrate at different temperatures. So the point is that since everything here can be predicted analytically and you can play around, you know, you can mess around with the elements inside this matrix, predict what would be the response of your system, say, oh, I don't like it, so you change a little bit this, and you keep iterating until the response becomes the, the response that you like. You can do this in a very, very precise manner. So for instance, this is, uh, uh, what we call the delta thermostat. So the idea here is that I run a dynamics and I want to keep all the vibrational frequencies of my system stuck at zero Kelvin, except for a, a very narrow range of frequencies that I set to finite temperature. And if you look at how the corresponding dynamics looks like, you see that as I 
target different frequencies, the dynamics of my system will automatically adjust to selectively excite the normal modes that correspond to that frequency. So you see, when I am in the libration band, I only excite librations. When I get to the bending band, my dynamics only excites uh, uh, bendings. Uh, and when I get uh, to the stretching band, I should jump, yeah, I start exciting only the, the stretches. And the point is that, yeah, Hmm. Okay, let, let me try to do something. This was not planned, I swear. So I, I do this just because we have time. Um. Okay, so what am I doing here? So here I'm, I'm taking uh, a specific form of this matrix, okay? So I have, uh, I, 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 have uh, I can write uh, some uh, specialized force, uh, forms of this uh, A matrix that enters the friction part of the memory kernel uh, in such a way that, uh, uh, that I can write the corresponding memory kernel, uh, for instance, in this case, as a sum of Lorentzian functions. Okay, so here I'm showing you the Fourier transform of the memory kernel that corresponds to a given uh, dynamics. And uh, I can, uh, you know, I can change uh, the center of this, uh, of this uh, peak in the memory function of the noise. I can uh, add, uh, where is that? Yeah, I can add multiple, uh, multiple peaks. I can add a white noise component to it, okay? So here I'm just showing you that I can instantaneously obtain a mem the memory kernel given a, a certain form of the matrix. But then you can also do more. You can, for instance, ask yourself, okay, if I take this noise and I apply it to the dynamics of a, of a harmonic oscillator of frequency one, what will be the dynamics of that oscillator? You don't need to run a simulation to find out. You basically only need to compute something analytical that gives you how an oscillator of frequency, you see, so this is a log-log scale, so this would be frequency one. So this is the velocity-velocity correlation function of that oscillator. In the absence of noise, I would get a delta function in, uh, in zero. In one, I mean, in log of the frequency equal to zero. If, uh, if I increase the, the white noise contribution, I broaden the response of the oscillator. This is like a damped harmonic oscillator. But you see how I can predict uh, how the system will respond very, very, uh, very, very quickly. So I can also do something uh, where, so right now I am uh, conserving the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And so if I look at the mean potential for a oscillator as a function of the frequency, it's a constant. But if I break the fluctuation dissipation theorem, now the temperature, the, I mean the mean potential for my oscillator as a function of frequency changes, is modul modulated. And I can adjust this to obtain a sharp peak in the position where I want it to be. So I can basically a priori design a Langevin dynamics that would set all the normal modes around 2,000 inverse centimeters to a temperature of 100 Kelvin, and all the other normal modes of the system will be frozen at zero Kelvin. Did that clarify at all? So this is sort of a, of a cute example, uh, but it's not particularly useful, at least in my opinion. So, but this actually can be used uh, to model nuclear quantum effects. Why? Well, I, I really love the harmonic oscillator, as you will see. <laughs> but uh, uh, if you look at the, if you solve the, the, the statistical mechanics of a harmonic oscillator classically, you get the probability of getting a certain uh, value of Q is a Gaussian distribution centered in zero. 
And if you solve the quantum mechanical problem for the same oscillator, you still get a Gaussian at any temperature. Hmm? I mean, ground state, of course, is a Gaussian, but if you use uh, um, a Boltzmann weighted combination of the excited states of a harmonic oscillator, magic, magic, you get a Gaussian at any finite temperature. And so uh, the point is that the only difference between the two cases is the amplitude of the fluctuations. So if you were able to simulate your classical oscillator at a higher temperature, you would be able to obtain precisely the same fluctuations uh, that you have in the quantum case. Okay, so from the point of view of the harmonic oscillator, all that you need to model nuclear quantum statistics is just changing the temperature. However, there is a problem. I mean, why people haven't done this this far? Well, the problem is that the effective temperature that you have to use is frequency dependent. In short, if your frequency is very small, your system will behave classically. So the target temperature should be the classical temperature. If your frequency is very high, you basically only have uh, 0 0.10 energy. So your temperature should be whatever uh, h bar omega half divided by kb, more or less, modulo a few. <laughs> but I mean, as a function of the overall uh, frequency, you need to obtain this kind of frequency dependence of the effective temperature that you enforce in, on different normal modes. But the point is that with this uh, colored noise machinery, you can precisely enforce this kind of frequency dependence automatically. So you don't need to know what's the vibration spectrum of your uh, material, of your molecule. You just design a generalized Langevin equation that gives you this kind of uh, frequency dependent fluctuations, and bam, in the harmonic limit, you get all the normal modes to respond the way they should. So this, so you might say, yeah, okay, whatever. If I have a harmonic system, uh, I, do, I don't need to run molecular dynamics. And but what is remarkable is that this idea works exceedingly well also for very harmonic systems. So here I'm basically showing you a quartic double well, which is pretty darn uh, anharmonic. And I'm showing you as a function of the height of the barrier. So the, basically the dashed li black lines uh, tell you what should be the average potential, kinetic, and total energy computed by solving the Schrodinger equation and computing the finite temperature density matrix. Basically, classically, well, the mean uh, kinetic energy would be 0 0.5. You have uh, equipartition. And uh, since it's anharmonic, uh, the mean potential uh, has this shape. But it's very different from the quantum case. But if you just take uh, uh, this generalized Langevin equation fitted to give the correct result in the harmonic limit, and you apply it to the system, you get the, the red dots. And it's for free. It's basically as expensive as classical molecular dynamics, but it gives you a pretty good approximation to quantum uh, statistics. So this actually surprisingly also works very well in, uh, in the condensed phase in uh, anharmonic problems that are not so, so trivial. So you can, for instance, look. Uh, so do you know what is a radial distribution function? Perhaps not every one of you. Well, OK, ju just so basically what I'm doing here, for those of you who don't know, uh, I'm sitting uh, on, a o on this case, I'm sitting on an oxygen atom in water. And I'm asking myself, uh, what's the probability that I have a hydrogen atom at a distance of one? Oh, a lot, because there is the covalent bond, which is about one angstrom long. So if I'm sitting on an oxygen, it's very likely that I will have two hydrogens one angstrom away from me. And this is sort of trivial. What is not so trivial is that then you have, in a longer range, um, a distribution uh, that is non-constant uh, and that you can measure by neutron uh, scattering, for instance. Uh, and, uh, and you can see that particularly for the OH stretch, classically you would have a very sharp peak. But when you switch on quantum effects uh, and the fully converged path integral molecular dynamics will be the black line, you get a much broader peak because you have 0 0.10 energy and you have much larger fluctuations. And if you just apply this generalized Langevin equation thing, I mean, 
it gets very, very much closer to the quantum result uh, for free. So it's not bad. So however, you have to be a little bit careful. So the situation is not so perfect as I make it sound like. Because the problem is that in this cartoon that I have presented to you earlier, I had assumed that the two different uh, normal modes were completely decoupled. So I have a system which is perfectly harmonic, and uh, the different normal modes don't speak to each other. But in any real system, you will have anharmonic couplings between different degrees of freedom. And what you are trying to do effectively, if you stay within this uh, uh, cartoon picture, you are trying to keep your high frequency modes hot and your low frequency modes cold. And if they can speak to each other, they will tend to equilibrate to the same uh, temperature. So what's happening is that in a real system such as water, you have uh, a fight going on between the two thermostats that try to keep uh, a temperature differential between different normal modes in your system, and uh, the intrinsic anharmonic crosstalk between different normal modes uh, that instead try to make the temperature the same everywhere. And so what you can do, which is very brutal, is just make the coupling to the thermostats very, very strong so that they win. And this, as I showed you, I mean, uh, this sort of works. Water is extremely anharmonic. The lifetime of, of a stretch is, is, is very short compared to anything that you would have in a solid. Still, you can get something decent just by making the coupling to the thermostats very strong. So however, my take in, uh, in all of these is that if you care about uh, nuclear quantum effects uh, that are important, but not the most important uh, uh, effect in, in, in the world, uh, you might as well get them right. So I was not completely satisfied with this, because uh, it's, you're sort of patching it up, but it's, you don't know how large is your error. So I started thinking, OK, wait a second, so we have on one hand, we have this quantum thermostat thing, which is exact in the harmonic limit, but in any real system will be approximate, and I don't know how large the, the error will be. And the, on the other extreme of the spectrum, I have pati integrals that are very accurate. I can make them as accurate as I wish, but they are too expensive. So what I can do, perhaps, is put a fraction of colored noise on top of a path integral simulation and hope that in doing this, I will keep the systematic convergence that is guaranteed by path integral molecular dynamics, but make it faster, since uh, somehow things will be exact in the harmonic limit. And actually, this can be done. And I, I mean, I, I just want to give you an idea of how this is done. And I, I actually urge you, if you have some time this evening, to go and do this kind of derivation yourself, because this is some, something that is just a, a way to convince yourself that path integrals work. So if you, if you, again, if you solve the quantum mechanical problem for a harmonic oscillator, you find that the mean fluctuations as a function of frequency should look like this. Okay, this is the same thing as the temperature that I showed you before, only converted in fluctuations of Q square. So instead, if you do a path integral molecular dynamics, what you have is a system where you have a spring, a chain of, of springs with periodic boundaries. Uh, since I gather that most of you are condensed matter physicists, this is you know, your beloved phonons in, in 1D. You have uh, periodic boundaries, and you have your, uh, your frequencies. And then uh, on top of that, you have an external harmonic potential, which is uh, the physical V. So oh, oh, I, I can't really go back all the way to the, to the path integral Hamiltonian. But if you remember, we had uh, uh, sum over P of V of Q. I mean, just the configurational part, the kinetic energy, who cares? Um, so you see, this would be your, I, I mean, and here uh, cyclic boundary conditions are implied. So I plus P is the same as I. Huh? So this is basically your uh, 
um, chain of oscillators. And then if you choose a harmonic potential, this is just one half uh, m omega square where omega is the physical frequency of your oscillator. So you see, this is a diagonal term. Oh, sorry, you are, of course, qi squared. So this is a, a diagonal term. So this just shifts all the frequencies for the closed chain of oscillators. And so if you, if you, you see that basically, this would be basically the dispersion for the chain of oscillators, and you just shift them up by omega squared. So these are the actual frequencies of the normal modes in your ring polymer when you have a physical potential of frequency omega. Hmm? Now, since uh, the potential is diagonal, it doesn't change the eigenstates of the, of the dynamical matrix. So, uh, so you can basically just transform, uh, since you know, the normal mode transformation for a chain of springs is, is a unitary transformation, so you can compute your expectation value of Q square for a ring polymer. You can compute it analytically just by transforming in normal mode coordinates. Normal mode coordinates will have the frequency, and classically, the expectation value of Q square for an oscillator of frequency omega is proportional to one over omega square. So basically, in the end, you get that the value of Q square for a finite number of P is just this. It's sum of one over omega k square, where omega k is given by this. Now you, you rush to your favorite handbook of series, and you look at how this looks like uh, uh, when you take uh, the P going to infinity term. Uh, basically, the trick is that in the P going to infinity term, you can linearize the sign, and then you can work out how that looks like. Or you can feed this to Mathematica, which is what I do, and you get that the limit for large P is precisely what it should be. No surprise here. However, now you can ask yourself this question. Let's not take the P going to infinity limit. If I don't take the P going to infinity limit, limit this will not, yeah. Yep. Well, it's, it's um, so if you have ever seen a quantum Monte Carlo talk, they, they typically speak about uh, timelines, uh, crossing, and uh, so here the, the springs, uh, if, if you stay within uh, this uh, ring polymer picture, uh, so let me go back. So the average path integral talk would show you something like this, okay? So you have multiple copies of your system that are connected by springs. Now, I prefer to show it like this. So you have parallel universes, and uh, the same particles in adjacent to parallel universes are connected by springs, okay? So the distinguishability here comes from the fact uh, that the springs uh, connect uh, the particle with the same index in adjacent parallel universes. If you want to have indistinguishability, you should also consider the possibility that the chain of springs for this hydrogen atom, for instance, uh, would uh, switch to this hydrogen atom, go around, and then close back onto that hydrogen atom. And actually, um, you can build the partition function for a system of undistinguishable particles as a sum um, of, of, of partition functions, one with the springs that close onto the same particle, one term that comes from two particles mixing up together, one part coming from three particles mixing up together, and, uh, and, and then you get bosons by summing them all with the same sign, and fermions, uh, basically, by using an opposite sign uh, when you have uh, an odd number of uh, particles into the combined uh, ring polymer, and minus when you have an even number. 
And clearly, the sign problem in this picture comes from the fact that you have a partition function, which is a sum of oscillating terms. The point is that both for bosons and for uh, uh, fermions, uh, the weight, the statistical weight of the uh, um, polymerized uh, ring polymers uh, um, partition functions uh, is very, very small. So you need to go down to very, very low temperature before this actually matter. So, okay, so we were here. And then, I mean, you can ask yourself, okay, but I want to, uh, you know, I, I, want, I want a word, uh, and, and I want that I have this relation not for only in the limit of p going to infinity, but for any value of, of p. I know that for the quant with the, with, by using a quantum thermostat, I can use a temperature dependent, a frequency dependent temperature that gives me this relation to within the accuracy of my fit uh, with just one replica. So why can't I do the same with two replicas? And you actually can do it. So you just write uh, the temperature dependent fluctuations like this, and you say, okay, I want to find what is the function, what is the fl uh, frequency dependent fluctuation that I need to enforce to obtain these for any finite number of p. And this is basically a functional equation because you see, hidden, this is the physical frequency omega, and this is the frequency of uh, one of the normal modes of the ring polymer that contains both the ring polymer frequency and the physical frequency. So the physical frequency enters, is hidden inside here. So this is a complicated functional equation, but you can solve it. And, and then you can get uh, something where we really can get the best of both worlds. Uh, and you, so this would be, for instance, for uh, the quantum kinetic energy of a hydrogen atom in water. It's large. Uh, thermal energy at room temperature is 25 millilitron volt. The kinetic energy, I mean, this is the difference with the classical kinetic energy, and it's 120, okay? So the quantum kinetic energy of a hydrogen atom in water at room temperature is about five times the thermal energy. So it's, it's big. And if you want to converge that using a conventional PIMD, you need at least 32 replicas. But if you use this colored noise on top of it, with four or six replicas, you are perfectly on top of it. And you see, the point is that uh, whereas with the quantum thermostat, I had just one point, uh, and the only way of knowing uh, how much I was wrong uh, was to converge uh, but integrals, which kind of defeats the purpose, right? Here I can systematically increase the number of replicas and see that it doesn't change anymore, so I am converged. And so, well, yeah, you can save more or less a factor of six uh, in, uh, in CPU time, which really makes it possible to do things that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. So I want to give you now, uh, I mean, perhaps, uh, do you have any questions up to this point? Because now I'm getting more into the applications. So if you have some questions about all of these, uh, this might be a good moment uh, to have them. Yeah? I'm doing it now. So uh, honestly, I'm doing this more as a curiosity. Uh, ju ju I'm, this is one of these things that I'm doing just because I can, and not because I think it's very important. So, uh, so you know that normally, if you have, if you go beyond uh, the primitive approximation, you start having commutators. Now, commutators, uh, most of the time, in the simplest uh, forms of high order expansions, uh, bring you a um, modulus square of the, of the force uh, inside the Hamiltonian. So that's okay if you're doing Monte Carlo, but if you want to do MD, when you compute, uh, you are doing classical, you are sampling that partition function by classical dynamics. Uh, so you need to do the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the Q. And when you do D over the Q of the modulus square of the force, you get a term that contains the Hessian. So it's very um, impractical. So People have been doing, uh, have sampled using Trotter and then reweighted uh, 
using the difference between the two terms, but the statistical properties are really bad. So, I mean, I'm doing it because why not, but I don't expect uh, these to be, very, it pro it's probably going to be useful for doing stuff at very, very low temperature. But then if you go at very, very low temperature, uh, you know, uh, boson or fermion statistics starts to become important, uh, and that's much, much harder to cope with uh, within this uh, uh, color noise uh, framework. So it's doable, but uh, I don't think it's going to be a game changer. So let's move on to application. So, uh, so the, the system where uh, it's perhaps more interesting to work about, uh, on nuclear quantum effects uh, is probably water, okay, because it's, because it's important. I think there is no need to discuss it. I'm, you know, I'm thirsty and I can drink. That, that, that's something that makes it very uh, interesting. Um, and also because it has a huge amount of hydrogen in it. So as you have seen uh, at the beginning, 90, more than 90% of the vibrational modes of water have a degree of quantumness at room temperature. So it's a system where you might expect quantum effects to be very strong, and in some cases they are. But if you look at some other physical properties, uh, say the change in melting temperature when going from H2O and H2O, it's 4 Kelvin. 4 Kelvin is nothing. It's 10% of the melting temperature. You will never, ever get... Uh, a empirical potential for water that gives you that kind of accuracy, not just by chance. So why the difference in, uh, I mean, for a system which is so strongly quantized, uh, how comes that, the, that many physical chemical properties change by very little when you go from hydrogen to deuterium? You know, the surface tension of water changes by one part in a thousand. Uh, it's, between H2O and H2O, so it's, it's kind of a puzzling question. And uh, based on sort of purely theoretical arguments back in 2000, around 2010, let's say, people have started to suggest that the reason why this happens is that you have a competition between quantum effects in water that go in opposite directions. So 0 0.10, to put it very, very simply, 0 0.10 energy along the stretching modes will tend, since the stretching is anharmonic, will make it a little bit longer, increase the dipole moment of the water molecule, and make the hydrogen bond stronger. However, the zero point energy in the liberation degrees of freedom will make it easier to break a hydrogen bond, and so the hydrogen bond will become weaker. And the idea is that the two components almost perfectly cancel out so that even though each component is very strong, the overall effect uh, is almost negligible. So um, an interesting thing, an interesting way to look into this uh, is by looking at the particle momentum distribution. So now I'm not looking at the, stra uh, as the position representation, basically, but I'm looking at momenta. And this is actually interesting because uh, I think that uh, it's all of you know that uh, based on classical mechanics, you would expect to have a distribution of P, which is just E to the minus P squared, so a spherical distribution, which only effectively depends on the mass and on the temperature. So there are these people in, uh, it's actually they, they work at uh, Rutherford Appleton close to Oxford, where they have uh, um, a neutron scattering beam line where they can have very high energy neutrons, so they can do Compton scattering uh, of uh, nuclei, and uh, they have a time of flight uh, measurement apparatus, so they can measure how much the velocity change upon uh, inelastic scattering, and they can infer what was the distribution of velocities of the nuclei that the neutrons have interacted with. Now, if the nuclei behaved classically, these people would be using an instrument which is worth tens of, of millions of uh, of dollars uh, to measure the temperature of their sample. But the point is that the particle momentum distribution is not Boltzmann, and it's not even spherical. So if you look at the particle momentum distribution for a proton in water, it is much more spread uh, uh, along the 
covalent OH bond, then it is in the orthogonal direction. And this is no rocket science. It's just that you have larger zero point energy in this direction. And so you have an, an, an anisotropic particle momentum distribution. And what is nice is that you can actually measure this anisotropy experimentally. And so you can get a direct experimental measure of this competition of quantum effects. So you can measure the particle momentum distribution, actually the three components of this kinetic energy tensor, uh, in the liquid and in the solid phase for Dichuo. This long story why it's Dichuo, but anyway. Uh, and uh, you do this in a simulation, and what you see is that the high uh, energy component goes down when you freeze but the low energy component goes up when you freeze. And the intermediate component changes by very little. So the point is that even though these two components change by quite a bit in going from the liquid to the solid state, the total kinetic energy changes by very little. And you can actually link the change in kinetic energy to the change in melting temperature between I mean, the change in kinetic energy between the two phases for a given isotope can be connected to the change in melting temperature upon isotope substitution. And uh, the nice thing is that if you make the experiment, uh, the experiment is a nightmare. I mean, they use the same software that they use as at CERN to do the error analysis because you have, I mean, you have to consider multiple scatterings uh, from the neutrons. So you have sort of a self-consistent problem to solve in, or, in order to get what is the actual s signal. So the error bar in the experiment here is a mystery, but it's pretty large. But at least qualitatively, you get the same trend. So you get uh, that the highest energy component goes down and the low energy component goes up, leading to a much smaller change in the total kinetic energy. And then uh, very closely connected to this, uh, um, you can look at another purely quantum mechanical effect, uh, which is uh, something which is called isotope fractionation. So, um, if you do classical statistical mechanics, uh, and you just look, uh, for instance, at the probability of having uh, an atom uh, in a phase or in another phase, uh, this can be related to the partition function and just the configuration part of the partition function, right? So in, uh, in classical statistical mechanics, uh, your partition function uh, can be factorized exactly. So basically, this doesn't change when you change the, I mean, it changes, but in a trivial way when you, uh, when you go to, from a phase to another. So this you really don't care about. The only part that you care about uh, is the partition function relative to the coordinate. And the mass enters nowhere here. So the statistical properties of hydrogen or deuterium should be identical if they behaved classically. But they don't. And one way to see this very clearly is that if you have uh, uh, two phases in equilibrium with each other, let's say liquid and uh, vapor water, you will have a different concentration of deuterium in the liquid and uh, in the gas phase. This is actually more or less how they do separate uh, heavy water from liquid water. It's, it's a multi-stage process, but at a certain point they do uh, fraction, uh, fractionation, uh, I mean, distillation of, uh, of water, and they separate out uh, the component which is richer in, uh, in Dichuo just by based on the fact uh, that you have a differential in, uh, in the concentration in the liquid and in the vapor. So this is used a lot in, uh, in geochemistry. In, uh, they actually use it also to um, analyze where a wine was, was produced, because the concentration of deuterium in the wine depends on uh, the year, uh, the, the location. So it's a way also to do sort of wine forensics. If you have followed the, uh, the Rosetta mission on the comet, there was all of this discussion about uh, how much deuterium is there in, in comet ice compared to the water on the Earth. And the question is, uh, the fact that it's different, uh, does it mean that the water on Earth doesn't come from comets? Or does it depend from the fact that in, uh, in 4 billion years, uh, comets have lost uh, uh, 
light uh, hydrogen preferentially uh, relative to, to heavy hydrogen. So all of these things can actually be computed. And this is very nice because this is typically a very delicate balance between effects. So it's something which is very small energy differences, but it's something that experimentally you measure basically by mass spectrometry. And uh, it's very easy to separate hydrogen and deuterium so they can measure the concentration of deuterium with as many uh, digits of accuracy that you can desire. And so this is nice for two reasons. First of all, it's a direct test of an effect which is only quantum mechanical. And also, if you are interested in doing simulations of matter in the condensed phase, this is also a fantastic way to benchmark uh, uh, models. of Because it's something where you have a very, very delicate effect that you can measure very accurately, and there is no uh, you know, there is no debate about the experiment. It's very, very clean. And you can also compute it by simulation. So what you need to do is, is sort of nice. So you have to do a, a thermodynamic integration. So you have basically to do many different simulations of your system in which you virtually change the mass of one of your particles from the mass of hydrogen to the mass of deuterium. And uh, you can show that basically by doing this, uh, by computing the kinetic energy for the different values of the mass and integrating, you get something that corresponds to the delta G for the exchange between the two phases. So you do this for uh, uh, ab initio simulations of water, for instance. And uh, I don't know, if you, if you have been to uh, talks of people doing ab initio calculations, they always uh, go around how, which functional they used. Uh, and here you can actually put the different uh, flavors of density functional theory and compare them with experiment. Uh, and, uh, and these are tiny energy differences. Eh? So here we are at uh, room temperature. So KBT is 25 milli electron volts. And this is basically, um, so this is probably like, uh, oh, I'm lost. Well, I mean, this is a small fraction of KBT. So these are really a few milli electron volt uh, uh, of difference in, in free energy between the different phases. But you can compute it. You can measure it experimentally. And so you can, for instance, understand something about uh, why PB uh, doesn't work, uh, if you know what PB is. It's, this is one of the most uh, popular version of, of DFT. And the most expensive versions work somehow better. Um, and then uh, I find it really nice that you have now, I mean, people are starting to look. The, the, the difficulty when, when you want to look at quantum effects is that you need something which is really selective for quantum effects. And you can get very, very subtle but interesting effects. So here, for instance, uh, um, so you, um, you can do something which is called uh, uh, some frequency spectroscopy. So what you're doing, you basically you have two um, infrared uh, lasers, uh, and you, sc you scatter out uh, um, something which is the sum of the two frequencies, and you detect that. Now, in order to have a non-zero uh, transition dipole for the sum frequency process, uh, you must have an environment uh, with no which is non-centrosymmetric. And it has to be non-centrosymmetric uh, on the length scale uh, of the wavelength of light. So you, you, have, you need to have an environment which is non centrosymmetric on the length scale of the hundreds, of, of hundreds and hundreds of nanometers. So the, what's nice about this experiment is that if you do this for a liquid, you only get a signal from the surface. Because in the bulk, uh, on a length scale of the 100 nanometers, you are homogeneous and uh, isotropic and centrosymmetric. And the only place where you have a broken symmetry is at the surface. And so you can detect a signal which is only coming from the surface of your sample. And so these uh, guys in, uh, in Boston were doing uh, experiments measuring the, the, the signal from the stretching uh, peak um, in mixtures of H2O and D2O. And uh, you know, what they were seeing was that as you uh, decrease uh, the fraction of H2O, 
the, stretch, the OH stretch signal goes down, and as you increase the fraction of the true, the OD stretch goes up. Not very surprising. What's surprising is that the, uh, the, intensity, the, the ratio of the intensities of the two peaks uh, was not consistent with the concentration in the bulk. So, and, and, and the problem that they had uh, was that uh, these are complicated experiments, and so the, the scatter of the experimental data was pretty much all over the place. So these are the red and the blue points are basically the estimated surface concentration, well, excess or depletion of hydrogen and deuterium at the surface. And uh, they, they were not so sure that they could publish this because results were all over the place, even though you could clearly see a trend in which uh, for half and half concentration you had about, uh, well, between uh, 6 and 1% uh, 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 change in concentration. So we actually could run a, a simulation for this, uh, and the nice aspect of studying uh, something like this uh, from a computational point of view is that you can really go and look uh, into individual points. So they have a very good sensitivity for the surface, but we can really go and look at individual atoms. So we can look, for instance, at the very, very, very first surface layer. And then we can, uh, just by looking at the orientation of a water molecule and the position relative to the surface, we can distinguish hydrogen atoms that stick out of the surface, hydrogen atoms that point down, and hydrogens that are lying flat on the surface. And we can look at how often we find a deuterium or a hydrogen in each place. And you can see that the only place where is, there is a difference with the bulk is really just for the OH that stick out of the surface. And, and the point is that we can compute these with very, very high accuracy. We don't, and so theoretically, we had these black uh, lines. These black dots, basically. So this is the error bar. It's tiny. And we could show that the simulation points were lying perfectly on a Lagomir absorption kind of curve. So basically, a curve with a single parameter could describe perfectly the, the concentration dependence of the surface excess. And so they could fit their noisy data to the same uh, uh, curve. And just out of luck, they got something that uh, falls almost perfectly on top of theory. I mean, the perfect agreement is clearly fortuitous, but I think that this is a nice story of how uh, simulation could give validation and uh, a reference model for an experiment which was very, very hard to interpret uh, just based on the experimental data. So final thing, uh, yeah, I want to give you some, uh, a long break before we go to the computer room. Um, yeah, I just want to show you briefly how, um, I mean, other kind of quantum effects that you can detect in water. And this is particularly interesting because it sort of shows you how much quantum effects uh, can change uh, our understanding of, uh, of something uh, as common as water at the uh, atomic level. So if you look at the simulation of classical water, so this water, uh, ab initio molecular dynamics, but the nuclei are treated classically. Uh, you can look at all the hydrogen bonds that you find and ask yourself, okay, so what's the angle of the hydrogen bond and what's the position of the proton along the oxygen-oxygen distance? So this is what's called the proton transfer coordinate. So that's the difference between the covalent bond length and the hydrogen bond length. And if you do your simulation classically, this is always negative. So your hydrogen is always closer to the oxygen it is covalently bound to than to the other. But if you switch on quantum effects, the picture changes quite a lot. And you start having some extreme quantum fluctuations that bring the proton closer to the acceptor oxygen than to the oxygen it was covalently bound to. And this is actually related also, it's coupled to electronic fluctuations. So here I'm basically looking at the electronic structure close to a hydrogen bond in terms of, uh, so on the y-axis I have a measure of, uh, uh, of whether a, an electron pair is like a bond or is like a lone pair, let's say. 
And if you do a simul the simulation classically, it's very clear that some uh, electrons are bond-like and some electrons are lone pair-like. But if you switch on quantum effects, uh, well, you increase the fluctuations along the proton transfer coordinate, uh, and also you start having uh, electrons that are a little bit, uh, they, don't, they don't know really what they are. And uh, these, the point is that these kind of quantum effects uh, in room temperature water don't lead to any major observable effect. Because uh, once your proton has quantum mechanically hopped uh, onto the nearby water, the energy to separate the two charges is too large, so it goes back. However, if you perturb the hydrogen bond network of water, for instance, uh, by increasing the pressure, the interplay between quantum effects and this uh, classical perturbation of the hydrogen bond network can lead to huge effects. So here, uh, these are simulations at 10 gigapascal and 750 Kelvin. So even at, here we are in basically supercritical water, still quantum effects matter a lot. So here I'm basically just analyzing the simulation to see how many neutral waters I have compared to H3O plus or OH minus. And if I look at the classical simulation and I see how many ionic pairs I detect, pretty much all of the snapshots of my simulation are fully neutral. However, you see that there is a little bit of uh, atoms jiggling around because the increase in pressure is bringing the oxygen atoms closer to each other and it's making it easier for the proton to delocalize. Now, if you also put nuclear quantum effects on top of that, that becomes very simple for the protons to go around and your system becomes actually super ionic. And by the end of the simulation, all the protons have exchanged with each other. So there is also a small effect on the density which is interesting because it's counterintuitive. So you would expect that you switch on quantum effects and they go, uh, and, and your density goes down because you have, uh, you know, the De Broglie wavelength of your uh, particles is different uh, from zero, so they swell up and they can go around. But actually you can see that the quantum simulation has a slightly higher density than the classical one. Then, uh, I don't know, this, you can also try to look at how uh, charge and quantum effects uh, couple in a, um, at room temperature. And also here you see, so this is basically, uh, in, in a classical simulation, uh, this is showing uh, how much the presence of a proton, you have an acid, so you have an excess proton, how much that perturbs the hydrogen bond network of water. And basically beyond uh, three and a half angstrom uh, from the proton, there is no effect. If you switch on quantum effects, well, everything gets more blurred because you can have larger quantum fluctuations. But also, if you see, you continue to have uh, uh, an impact on the degree of the localization up to much longer distances. And this is not a purely electrostatic effect, but it's something really that has to do with the interplay between the hydrogen bond network and quantum effects. So, and this is, now I just want to briefly introduce what we will do in the, in, in the lab uh, after the coffee break. Um, so you ask yourself, okay, you have introduced path integrals, colored noise, how are we going to, to do this? Uh, I have my favorite uh, ab initio molecular dynamics code, CP2K, ab init, quantum espresso. I, I suppose that quantum espresso is quite popular here in Trieste. Uh, well, it, it's a lot of work to implement all of this stuff into your favorite code. So rather than suggesting that you should do that, uh, what I did was uh, making a, a, a Python code that communicates uh, with your uh, um, ab initio electronic structure code uh, that you, I mean, the one that you love most, uh, using uh, internet sockets. So they two basically run independently. You have to do very, very little change to uh, your electronic structure code and you get all of these uh, automatically. And if you want to get the, you know, I discussed this fitting and I showed you this, uh, I mean, this, 
thing where you can play around with the form of the noise, you don't have to do this in order to get the, uh, the parameters that you need to simulate quantum effects in a certain system. There is this website, you just go there, you select which kind, which kind of color and noise you want, pick the code that you want to use this with, and you get the stuff that you need to paste into your simulation to get it to run. So let me just thank the people who were involved with this. So this is really the work uh, of almost five years, uh, starting from uh, the second half of my PhD up to now. So this started back in, uh, in Lugano when I was doing my PhD with, with Michele Parrinello and, and with Giovanni, who is now at CIS. And then, uh, and there I was working mostly on the classical uh, sampling problem with colored noise. And then in Oxford with David, uh, um, we worked on combining this with quantum effects. Now in Lausanne, we are refining this, you know, putting the final touches, uh, uh, high order uh, propagators and so on, uh, together with Bin Ching and Piero, two very bright students. Ali, he, who works here at SCTP, is also involved in many of the, of the projects and many other people. So uh, to wrap up, uh, uh, I hope that you walk away with the, um, with the feeling that nuclear quantum effects uh, are something uh, to consider, at least. They might not be important or might be important for your problem, and it's generally worth uh, checking. Um, the standard way is patintegral molecular dynamics, which is uh, actually orders of, I mean, it's exponentially better than solving the Schrodinger equation, but still it's very demanding. And if you want to make it faster, you can use colored noise. So if you just want to have a qualitative idea, you can use the quantum thermostat. If you want, uh, uh, to be systematic, uh, you can combine packet integrals and colored noise. And you can get this fairly easily. And as you will see, it's not too hard to run it. So thank you a lot for your attention. And uh, let me know if you have any questions.